It's time for Hostile Discourse, Episode 10. Now your host, David Rolfing. Hey everyone, welcome to Episode 10 of Hostile Discourse. Who knew we would get this far? Pretty soon we will be at 100. Woo! There's a lot to talk about this week. The Nintendo Switch big reveal was just a week ago. And we also have a few video game related debate topics to go over towards the second half of the show. First, let me introduce you to our guests returning from last time, Joe and Jacob. Hey. Hey. And returning from the Rogue One specials, Tim. Good to be back. And back all the way from season one, I believe it was the Apple releases and Tech Talk episode, Noah Roberts. Stoked to be back. Oh, so stoked. There's much to talk about concerning the Nintendo Switch. I tried to gather a nice, diverse group of video game players here. Jacob is definitely our resident Nintendo fanboy. And proud. I'd say I'm a not too distant second place. Me too. I'm definitely not second. Tim is our PlayStation 3 and 4 owner. I've also dabbled in the 360. The dark arts. And then I'm kind of the diehard, uh, maybe not diehard, but the most consistent Xbox fan out of us. I've had the original Xbox 360 and now Xbox One. Mainly because of the Halo series, I would say. It's such a good series. PC gamer for life. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, and we'll consider Joe our PC gamer. <laughs> not really, but that's fine. <laughs> Until you spent $500 on a video card, you're not a PC gamer. Yeah. Yeah, he uses a laptop, not a true PC <laughs> gamer. <laughs> Definitely not. Unless it's that new, chunky, huge laptop from CES. Acer? Oh, I saw that video. It's got like, does it have like two fans in it or something? It's like, like $8,000 or something like that. Look dope. Does it come standard with like a Decepticon logo on the side too? Something like that. It definitely looks Transformer-ish. Let's get right into the Nintendo Switch conversation. I'll read you some of the console details, the specs real quick. So it has 32 gigs of internal storage. Um, you can use micro SD cards to expand up to like 512 gigabytes but that would be probably like 300 bucks if you needed that space the screen on the tablet six and a 6.2 inches the screen is 720p which is the lowest hd resolution um, but it can go up to 1080p when you put it in the dock for a tv and they also said battery life will last two and a half to six hours which is a pretty big range but for a higher power requiring game like zelda would only last like two and a half hours they said what do you guys think disappointed surprised content not disappointing or surprising in my research i was extremely surprised in fact to see how many people were disappointed by this knowing that it was going to be both a home console and a portable console even from uh before the trailer when there was still uh thoughts that this was going to be a more standard home console it was it's not in nintendo's nature to be pushing the boundaries of technical home consoles so what's important is that it's going to get the job done uh breath of the wild is going to look amazing both docked and undocked does the 720p tablet screen surprise you at all all the hands-on all the hands-on stuff i've seen say it looks amazing that's the lowest resolution that's considered high definition it's a small screen. Smaller screen, yeah. Yeah, with with a smaller screen, I don't think it'll make that big difference. I mean, if you think looking at a 1080p 50-inch screen 10 feet away versus looking at a 6-inch 720p screen 2 feet away, it's probably not going to make that big of a difference. I also, I would put Nintendo solidly in the will not engage in spec war category. They're not the type of company that's going to try and compete with the big dogs in terms of just raw power. They're more of an experienced company, kind of like Apple. They care a lot more about the integration of hardware and software. So I expect the games like Zelda and some of the other games that we saw in the presentation, those are what's going to sell the console, not necessarily specs. Especially given the type of gamer that Nintendo usually goes after. It's just, it's a different demographic than someone who is more likely to buy a PS4 Pro or a Xbox One S. Initially, I was kind of disappointed with the overall specs of the console, but the more I think about it, I know that that was probably just a decision based on cost savings, and really they're putting that money into the Joy-Cons because of all the new technology crammed in there. So I'm not too 
mad about it anymore. Batteries are always an issue with mobile devices, so you kind of expect that there. How's the battery on, like, the Nintendo or the 3DS, Jacob? There's too many versions. I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm, I'd am i be guessing, but I think the first one, the, the only one I had was seven hours. It's enough you don't really have to worry about the battery, right? Yeah. yeah. But yeah. would not last you a transatlantic flight. That's true. That That's so funny is, like, when you think about the battery, I'm on. I probably didn't really put too much thought into it, but I was like, okay, when are you trying to play a home console game for more than two hours at a time? It's just a plane. It's just a plane flight, right? <laughs> like, that's the go-to hypothetical. Yeah, but- I have to agree with Jacob on this. The times where, because I'm the type of gamer that loves a good home console experience, sitting down, putting in a considerable amount of time into a game, that it's kind of disappointing that the Airline flights wouldn't maybe be as feasible now if you wanted a game for a long period of time. But something I didn't even consider until the Switch event was televised was they actually were making, in my mind, the first really good case of having social party games for adults like our age. And I think in that situation, how long do you play a game at a party for before getting tired? It's certainly not more than like an hour or two. So in that case, even on the low end of the battery spectrum, that would be totally fine. Yeah, I, I agree with that for sure. Like, Too bad we that were, their party games were awful. <laughs> oh, Joe. I actually don't think so. Like, after playing Red Dead Redemption for so much, I felt really intrigued by and wanting to try out the, the I guess, like, draw the Joy-Con out of your fake holster. That seemed really neat to me. The Yeah, that'd be cool for, like, ten minutes until you realize all you're doing is seeing who can pull out their Joy-Con faster, and you could literally just have a third person standing there and be like, no, he drew it faster. <laughs> I feel like if that's what they're going to like plug it on is who can draw a gun faster. And then like that game was pretty dumb. And then the other one, that arms game, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, but it's literally just Wii Boxing with stretchy arms. <laughs> oh, Joe, I, I'm disappointed in... Um, in the amount of thought you put into this, like <laughs> I agree, our, I was I was really surprised that Nintendo even announced a new IP like that. That was like a big deal when Splatoon came out. It's like, oh my gosh, the new Nintendo IP is going to get announced. So that was like almost too much to handle. Like I, I was trying to process a lot. Like with Arms going along, I was like, I was trying to think who's the developer, like who's behind this. But it's a Nintendo thing. I mean, it, they went out and said it on one two switch and arms that those are going to be games that they're focusing on being highly replayable and with like good solid game mechanics the best comparison as far as one two switch would be probably nintendo land the launch title for the wii u i think that was their like somewhat tech demo party game and i put in with my like christmas morning like my family put in hours into that game we have never done that before like that was an experience that a group of people was able to enjoy that that's one of the most exciting parts about the switch to me is that possibility for party games one big mistake i think nintendo made with that is nintendo land came with the wii u wii sports an incredible game with a ton of replayability fun for the whole family, came with the Wii, but 1-2 Switch, I mean, I guess I can't knock it until I try it, but it doesn't look as fun as Wii Sports or have that amount of replayability, and it didn't come with the console. Like, I don't know how many people would pay 50 or 60 bucks for that game, because I know I sure wouldn't, unless they bundled it. Those are my thoughts, too. I I think it's like a cool-looking concept, but it, it's just a mini game. It is what it seems to me that it is. Well, both, going, both concepts. Real quick, going along with Joe's statement just then, it's just a mini game. I'm thinking of how much fun the WarioWare mini game series is, and those are ultimately just a collection of mini games that are super replayable, very fun, um, very much based on reaction times and things that hardcore gamers really prize. I think within games. So I am still completely open to seeing if three, two, one switch or whatever, one, two, three, switch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just one, two. Oh, my bad. Sorry. Uh, if that, I think it could be really fun because I still have really fond memories of not even owning a Wii, but playing Wii sports for the first time and just being floored 
by the motion technologies in a simple game like the tennis matches. So I, I think I'm I'm personally open to it being cool. I agree with Tim. I think there's still a lot to be known about the game. I don't know even if they announce some other things about it or show some other things about it, if it really will be worth uh, the $50 that they're asking for it. But I know at least just like from what I've seen on the little teaser website that they have up, there's lots of other concepts using kind of the reaction time idea. I know one that's been getting talked about online is the one involving uh, milk udders. So, <laughs> I mean, it, it, they're, they're pushing the boundaries, man. It, it, it could be a, a really interesting concept. I'm disappointed that it's not included or at the very least like a $20 no-brainer throw it in when you buy the console so oh yeah i'm disappointed but also intrigued that that that's the biggest disappointed appointment to me about the presentation and what's even weirder is like you go and watch videos of people at like the hands-on things and what's on the screen is so like graphically it's comparable to what i saw in my game design class at tu like it's it's simple text on plain backgrounds. There's not any design going on. So, like... Why are they charging that much? It, uh, yeah, but... They're gonna bundle it. By the end of the year, no one's gonna buy it, and they're gonna bundle it together with the Switch. But I'm gonna have bought it by then. <laughs> <laughs> it pretty much seems like the game is made to show off the new Joy-Con tech. I mean, some of it looks pretty cool. There's... No. An amiibo little reader on there. The HD vibration or whatever it's called seems to be like the coolest new feature. Um, I've heard people talk about it that used it at the demo like in New York. And they said it was pretty awesome what you could feel in the controller. But at the same time, like I can feel that playing Zelda shooting a bow or something awesome. And I don't need to in like a lame looking game like... One, two, switch. I can, I can blindfold myself, have someone throw a couple ice cubes in a cup, and I'll guess how many are in there. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds but good. But it's not a neon red Joy-Con. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. That that was a cool concept to me. That how, I don't know how they do all that motion technology, but like with the whole filling up the glass thing, I mean, obviously it's not changing its weight. So, I mean, it, it is kind of cool how they're doing that. I, I don't really know. I've never felt it, but that seems like a cool concept that could go places. The guys that went to the tech demo kind of described it as you could feel the individual motors in the controller. So, the vibration, like, kind of goes up the length of the Joy-Con. So, you could actually, it actually felt like the water was filling up the glass, like they demoed on in the press event. So, it's some pretty, like, high-tech stuff going on in there. Yeah, for sure. What do you think about the Joy-Con? Initially, it looked kind of small to me, but yeah. I think some people are saying it feels pretty good in the hand. What else? What do you think about the controller? It keeps looking smaller in all these new pictures I see. Like People are comparing... If you compare it to a 3DS XL, I think that was the comparison that really made me realize how small it was. And what my probably my biggest reservation about the hardware right now is playing local multiplayer and having to use the right Joy-Con with the thumbstick so far in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> Only because the shoulder buttons are tiny and it's so far back on the left side of the controller. So like your thumb is normally like your thumb and your trigger finger will are kind of going to going to end up on the same point on that line on the controller, right? That parallel line to whatever. I, I, the geometry of it. I'm sure there's <laughs> actual ergonomics but like they i don't know it doesn't look like it lines up doesn't look that comfortable yeah it's kind of like getting that crappy off-brand second player <laughs> at your friend's house oh yeah mad cats are like <laughs> <laughs> i just actually threw away a mad cats n64 controller i found in my parents basement back home not a single button on it worked i do think the the technology in the joy con is a big selling point and oh, yeah. i mean even beyond obviously like the motion controls when the Wii came out was a big deal albeit i mean definitely part of that was just kind of the wow factor but i do think that specifically like the hd vibrations and stuff could add a really cool element to playing games on a switch especially zelda i'm anxious to see what they do uh to incorporate that into that game it and like 
more than a gameplay aspect like one two switch i bet just like feedback from the hd rumble it's probably going to make an experience more than you we might expect i think it's it's one more way to immerse you deeper into the game yeah on the xbox one they really advertised the vibration and the the individual triggers on the controller so like in forza motorsport you can feel the brakes and or like the tires skidding on the road and in fps as you can like kind of feel the gun trigger as you shoot but overall it was kind of a disappointment and not a game changer whatsoever so i really hope that the joy con vibration isn't just a stupid gimmick but is actually pretty cool and enhances gameplay well i think david raises an interesting point because if we look back on these different motion controls for say the wii and wii u i never owned these nintendo consoles but it was always a real struggle from my understanding for non-nintendo based developers to really get a good handle on how to effectively and ingeniously use what is potentially a very deep way of interfacing with the controller what do you think jacob I think you're right, and I think it's not going to be as much of a problem this time. Uh, Nintendo's sending out a lot of dev kits for the Switch, and from what it looks like, they're giving a lot of support to indie developers. That's kind of what my mind turns to when we find that 1-2 Switch might be this game that uses so much of the cool technology but costs so much, is when we ex- expect like the indie developers to step up. And, I mean... Shoot, I I don't know when they first showed that picture of all those different third-party developers that they were working with for the Switch, but that might be that might be the biggest kind of shift from the Wii and Wii U era into the Switch. One other thing I will say: so was it standard for the Wii to have two Wii modes packaged in at launch? Just one? No. So now, now the Switch effectively is coming with two controllers in each. That's something that they they emphasized in the presentation. They I talked about the it. evolution of Nintendo gaming consoles, and when they went uh, through and talked about the NES, they said, this console came with two controllers, which I thought was interesting. Like, well, why'd you give up on that? <laughs> which I think is necessary, because I know you can buy a single Joy-Con for 50 bucks or a pair for 80 and so it's actually more expensive than other consoles to get that third and fourth player to be able to play Mario Kart or whatever, split screen. I know a lot of people online have been complaining about the prices of most of the accessories. I mean, the Pro Controller is like 70, a 70 bucks. I mean, ha- that's not, it's not more expensive than the money you'd be paying for more DualShocks. The Xbox One controllers are 50 now, 60 ESRP. Right, but the, the PS4 ones are 60 I mean, if you buy, so you buy the console, you get one DualShock or Xbox One controller. You got to buy two, that's another $100. Whereas if you buy a second pair of Joy-Con, you you can have four people playing Mario Kart. I mean, I, th- I think you have four halves of a controller kind of versus, I don't know, buying three holes. Can someone explain to me the logic of the, the Pro Controller? The Pro Controller is essentially just like an Xbox 360-shaped controller. The joysticks are in the top left and bottom right, which is actually different from the Wii U Pro Controller, but it's just like a more normal, classic-shaped gaming controller for more competitive play. So, I, But, I mean, the po- obviously you can't play all the games you could with the Joy-Con, so, so getting a Pro Controller is essentially like having a controller that conforms to what an Xbox controller would do, but so that you can feel like you're using an Xbox controller? I mean, like, why not just use only Joy-Con controllers? It doesn't have the same motion tracking capabilities as the Joy-Cons, but it does have the HD vibration, so some of the new tech is in there, but essentially it's just a controller for people who don't care as much about the motion games, but more competitive games like Splatoon. Yeah, it's probably just going to be the most ergonomic, best way to play single-player games on home console mode, which is probably... I mean, that's a significant chunk of people that buy video games. So I, I think it makes sense for them to to use that or make that accessory. And like, I got one of the Pro Controllers for the Wii U, 
and didn't regret it. But again, I mean, a lot of this stuff comes down to that price point. Tim, you mentioned earlier the software developers. So let's talk a little bit about the launch games. The lack of Pretty much the only good one is Zelda. The only great one. <laughs> Do you know if the date of that game is exactly March 3rd or does it come out later that month? Right. It's on the day that you can buy a Switch. You can buy Breath of the Wild. And then... Super Mario Odyssey comes out holiday 2017, so probably not until December. And then Skyrim comes out in the fall. (laughs) Yippee. What's so funny? It's so old. It doesn't matter, man. It's one of my favorite games. Man, I just love Skyrim and all of the Elder Scrolls series. And I think the real appeal with the Switch is just freaking being able to play that on a train or an airplane and have like envy from all of the other people on the airplane. You're <laughs> like, man, I wish I was as cool as that guy. Yeah. I mean, they, they made a special edition not that long ago. It's not the special edition. It's not. It's just normal. Yeah, this Skyrim. is going to be crappy graphics. What? The switch couldn't handle the graphics that it needed. Yeah. It was disappointing. That is surprising. Okay. It, it's essentially like they made Skyrim. They made a better version of Skyrim and now they're giving the old crappy version of Skyrim to the winner. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly true. I mean, I, I love Skyrim, and like, if all I had was a Nintendo, I'd definitely probably get it for it and play it, but I just don't think that that's going to be a major selling point. Other new games, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe comes out, which is basically just Mario Kart 8 from the Wii U with some DLC. No, I mean, it's it includes all DLC and adds the battle mode and, and more stuff. So it's it's a it's a pretty hefty expansion. Does it add new racers? Yeah. yeah, yeah, King Boo, <laughs> the Squid Boy and Squid Girl from yeah. Splatoon. Ooh, oh yeah, Splatoon Two. Jacob, did you play the first one? I played Splatoon. Yeah, I never bought it. Um, it looks fun. It it's pretty fun, but it seems like it would take a few hours to get used to, and I never had that chance. Like it's it's just a turf war, which you don't. I don't know. I've never played a game like, like that from the old Tony Hawk games. Oh, dude. I, that's pretty obscure. Were there turf wars in there? Yeah, where like you you would uh, fight skaters. No, like you would you had spray paint. Oh. You would do tricks. Yeah, graffiti, which basically turned into graffiti in certain areas of a map, and yep. you gotcha. had to yeah see yeah. Anyway, like I'm not Splatoon completely got, ridiculous. Splatoon was a huge success, and it gained a pretty big following. So it's awesome that it's got a such a regular sequel. If I, ha- I mean, if I had to pick three games, I think it might be the third for this year after Mario and Zelda. Meaning what you're most interested in? Yeah. Yeah. I think um, with, I don't even know if we have time to get into the online, but I bet, I bet Nintendo does some cool stuff with a big online agenda that they're trying to roll out. Well, they're going to make us pay for it. Well, yeah, and I mean, <laughs> that's what Splatoon really was, like, from what I, my impression is like... That's only online multiplayer, right? No, I, I'm, I don't want to say anything wrong, but I think there's, I think there's local on the Wii U. Yeah, so Nintendo's rolling out a new online Xbox Live type thing. It doesn't come out until the fall, officially. It does have a cool program where you get a NES game or classic Nintendo game like on the virtual console. Super Nintendo game. I think maybe even GameCube. Uh, much like the games with gold on Xbox Live or the PSN equivalent. Do we know what the Switch virtual console is going to be like? Are they going to have all the stuff that they've released so far on Wii U? No, I I haven't seen any details on that. But Yeah, they're so weird about that, like what's available between consoles. So They haven't said that much on that. But the one big drawback to this program is after the month is up where the game came out, it deletes. You don't get to keep them like you do on Xbox Games for Gold. Oh, you, what if you pay for the subscription-based service? Can you keep it for the whole month? Wow, that's really so like bizarre. You could download it January 1st and play it all of January, but then on January 31st, in order to keep playing it, you have to pay for it. Wow, that's really strange because with the PlayStation Plus, I don't know how... And that's the paid subscription service for Sony consoles now. Um, for example, I bought a really fun game called Rocket League when I had, was paying for it, not paying for it, couldn't play Rocket League, but it still existed on my console. 
I now pay for the service again, can still play Rocket League. So it didn't de- delete itself after the month was over, which I'm actually really surprised Nintendo's doing that. It's also worth noting the free trial starts in March, and in the fall is when it becomes paid. Yeah, oh, It's wait, not just so. a one month. Oh. It also wouldn't surprise me if N- Nintendo kind of uses that free trial or whatever they want to call it, that first few months. It wouldn't surprise me if they really use it as a way to test all the things that they want to do so that by the time you are paying for it, they've kind of gotten to a more refined product. I mean, it's not it's not easy to just go live with something as big and as server intensive as like an online platform. So it'll take them a while to work out the kinks. So hopefully they kind of realize that it's dumb to boot you from a game that you've been playing for a month. Do we know if the friend-based inner interface is going to be better? I do know that the voice chat or lobby chat is over the mobile app. So on your iPhone or Android phone is where you talk to people on their network. Yeah, I think that that actually kind of sounds pretty cool. I'm anxious to see what they do with that. Just because, like, I hate having to get a mic (laughs) to communicate. I don't know. I don't mind. So... You I mean that, that it is really cool. makes me mad. <laughs> well, you already have you'll, your phone. You don't. You already pay yeah. You already have all the stuff you want. Yeah. So you're saving that twenty five dollars. <laughs> might as well put it to our. <laughs> That's how they justify fifty dollars for one two switch. What do you guys think of Super Mario Odyssey? Stoked, 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 Dude, stoked, it, stoked, stoked. That's kind of been my thing with Nintendo uh, for the past like seven years is I have these games that I really cherish and then uh, they take the they take that series and then change them a lot so like Super Mario Sunshine as this open world Mario platformer was one of the one of the defining games of my childhood and then they kind of lost that for them to explicitly say it is going to be like Super Mario 64 and Super Mario Sunshine um, was a really special moment from that announcement. I don't want to really nitpick at it because since I haven't played it yet, but I'm going to, uh, the new donk city shot from the trailer just kind of put me off a little bit. Like I always thought of Mario as a human and all the other creatures are, you know, like cartoony creatures and Mario is the human, but in new donk city, the New York city ripoff, there are other humans there that, look completely different from him. They're way taller and just like differently shaped overall. Um, I thought it was a little strange how they portrayed the city with the more realistic feel and the people. I'm anxious to see because even like when they show clips of Mario with other humans, like he is very clearly like half their height. I'm anxious to see how they put into the storyline how he ends up in this world with other humans. Oh, yeah. That's not the Mushroom Kingdom. It's the first game in the Nintendo multiverse. Oh, no, yeah. No. <laughs> um, but kind of similar, like, thought. What I'm more interested in is with these other, um, with all the previous 3D Mario platformers, the NPCs, like, the way you interact with them is super cartoony. And so, like, you go and jump on them and you like they're like super bouncy and they like make weird noises but like that i don't see them doing that for like regular people walking around a city so it's it's exactly the kind of thing i trust a nintendo creative team with and i mean you said like super mario sunshine was more like super mario 64 where it was more like you had a hub and stoke model maybe and i never played super mario uh What's the one on the Wii and Wii U? Galaxy. Oh, yeah. But is that different than that? Progressively more linear. I love Galaxy. Up until, like, up to Super Mario 3D World and, yeah, 3D World on the Wii U that was um, really, like, I don't know, a lot more like, um, if you played Sunshine, right, those special levels that were, like, you didn't have your, you didn't have the flood jetpack and... Um, explicitly platforming, a lot yeah. more of that kind of stuff. So it, it actually it's been strangely linear. So this, so Odyssey will be more of a return to. It looks like a, it looks like a huge difference from S- Super Mario 3D World, which cool. would be the the last in this installment. If if we're really all counting these as 
as like the 3D Mario series. Yeah, I'm down. I'll play as we it. wrap up our thoughts on the Switch, did you guys pre-order it? Are you going to buy it? What are your plans? I didn't pre-order, but I do plan on buying it at the very least in 2017, hopefully on launch day. Um, I'm aiming for launch day too. Have not pre-ordered. Well, all the pre-orders are sold out online, everywhere. GameStop, Walmart, Walmart, Best Target, Buy. Amazon. It's gonna fail. So, <laughs> so Jake and I might camp out. Uh, I, I myself am not gonna buy it, but I also only own an Xbox 360 that I've had for a long time, so it's not <laughs> like I'm all up to date on video game consoles. But I do want to say I feel like I've been kind of hard on it. <laughs> In the stuff I've been saying, and I'm sure Jacob hates that, but I, I think that it definitely has some promise, and I, I think that it it could be a really good gaming system, so I hope it is. Thank you, Joe. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just a little redemption from all my bashing I was giving. Yeah. It. No. It's weird. For the first time since arguably the GameCube, I'm really interested in buying a Nintendo console. I think the reason being my tastes have really changed as a gamer. Nowadays, I don't play so much online anymore as more of just really immersive single-player experiences. Maybe it's just because I think I have a stressful life. I probably don't. I really like video games as kind of a detox. And I can see playing something like Breath of the Wild and really treating it as that sort of immersive and relaxing experience. You're going to love it. Real quick note on Breath of the Wild. I'm nervously optimistic for the first open-world Zelda. I thought you were going to mention the voice acting. Me too. That's what I thought you were going to say. As someone who's currently playing through Ocarina of Time on my DS. You played it like every year. I don't know. I'm interested to see how all of the mechanics will change with a less linear storytelling style. It would be fun to go fishing with the Joy-Con. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Let's go fishing on Karamja. Ah, Karamja. (laughs) I, I, I just think it's funny that like, I feel like that's the experience people have with the first Zelda, is open world. You get no, you get no information other than what if you wanted to read the game manual. Like spiritually, it like I think it was pretty inspired by that. Spiritually, <laughs> <laughs> wow! The spirit of in the spirit of Zelda, right? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I think one time they called Super Mario Galaxy the spiritual sequel to. Super Mario 64 and I was like what about Super Mario Sunshine like, <laughs> I was like really heard about it that's why I sucked at Ocarina of Time as a kid oh yeah I maybe same. made it in like 10% and then couldn't figure out what to do they barely give you any instruction I was little and stupid I, I mean I, I will say I have a brother who's six years older than me and there's probably something something that's special about that game is that it really reminds me of being a kid and not really understanding, but watching him play with our cousin and then kind of as I got a few years older, playing the game myself. So there's definitely some kind of nostalgic aspect to why I like that game so much. Yeah. And now that I know how to do everything, I started playing it a week ago and I just beat the Water Temple, so. Woo! (laughs) All right, enough about the Switch and now on to Joe for our new Season 2 segment, Tolkien Time with Joe, where Joe picks out a passage from any Tolkien book of his choosing to spark the creative and intellectual juices we need for these debates. <laughs> All right, so the passage that I picked out this week um, comes from the Silmarillion, and many of you have probably heard of the Silmarillion before. It's kind of the origin story of Middle-earth, and... The story that I picked refers to Baron and Luthien, which is important to me because uh, coming out this May actually is a new book called Baron and Luthien, which covers their story more in depth. Um, so I, I kind of picked a passage from that to share with you guys today. And to set the stage, uh, this takes place um, during the reign of, of Morgoth, who's kind of Sauron's leader. So he's a, the big bad guy of Middle Earth. And Baron is a man, Luthien is an elf, and they've kind of fallen in love. And so Baron approaches Thingol who is Luthien's father, and is basically asking um, for her hand. So here goes. Thingol looked in silence upon Luthien, and he thought in his heart, Unhappy men, children of little lords and brief kings, shall such as these lay hands on you and yet live? Then, breaking the silence, he said, I see the ring, 
barren, and I perceive that you are proud and deem yourself mighty. But a father's hands, even had his service been rendered to me, avail not to win the daughter of Thingol and Melian. See now, I too desire a treasure that is withheld. For rock and steel and the fires of Morgoth keep the jewel that I would possess against all the powers of the elf kingdoms. Yet I hear you say that bonds such as these do not daunt you. Go your way, therefore. Bring to me in your hand a Silmaril from Morgoth's crown, and then, if she will, Luthien may set her hand in yours. Then you shall have my jewel. And though the fate of Arda lie within the Silmarils, yet you shall hold me generous. Thus he wrought the doom of Doriath, and was ensnared within the curse of Mandos. And those that heard these words perceived that Thingol would save his oath, and yet send Baron to his death. For they knew that not all the power of the Noldor before the siege was broken had availed even to see from afar the shining Cimmerils of Fionor. For they were set in the Iron Crown, and treasured in Angbad above all wealth, and Balrogs were about them, and countless swords and strong bars, and unassailable walls, and the dark majesty of Morgoth. Thank you for that lovely reading, Joe. I look forward to it every other week. <laughs> <laughs> T.Y., Joe, T.Y. <laughs> and now, on to our exciting video game debates. Noah is our judge this week, taking the seat of Chris as our unbiased judge. Hopefully this week he picks the rightful winner. <laughs> oh, brutal. He will. <laughs> Trust fired. me, he will. <laughs> First debate question. Which video game's protagonist would be the best to be? So if you were in their storyline. I will start. I'm very confident in my answer as um, specifically the Pokemon trainer from the Generation 2 games. Nameless? You name him yourself. Okay, um, so it's not like Ash or anything? No. That game would be... It's the best world to live in because you can leave home when you're 11. You catch all these cool Pokemon. Um, when you beat people in Pokemon battles, they give you a ton of money. You don't... You don't have to buy a house. It's it's easy to live on the move. Um, and you are destined for greatness as Pokemon champion. And it's such a long adventure you get to go on. Um, so many characters along the way. You get to fight crime. Uh, you're, you're generally very well liked. Um, you become much better at Pokemon training than everyone around you, which is a great perk. Uh, you capture legendary beasts like Lugia that has served me so well in this game. So I'll leave it there for now, but it is the, uh, it's really the ideal world for a carefree and exciting life. Solid pick. I'll admit it. Uh, all right, I'll go next. Um, uh, my pick is Edward Kenway from, Pi uh, from Assassin's Creed Pirates 4. Of the Caribbean. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Said Pirates, said Pirates of the Caribbean. Of the Caribbean. <laughs> uh, Assassin's Creed 4. Black Flag, um, which is a great game, first off, and was much better than its predecessor, Assassin's Creed 3. Um, and I actually just finished playing through it only a month or two ago. Um, and he, basically, the, the premise is that he's a pirate um, who kind of gets involved with the Assassins, if you're familiar with the Assassin's Creed universe. Um, gets to live this amazing life, owns a pirate ship, owns an island, um, has all these people at his control basically um and is kind of a great leader uh kind of lives how he wants to and the best part about uh edward kenway is something i'll explain next so I'll, I'll go to someone else first i'm really excited to debate the edward kenway discussion because he's just such a cool video game character and i agree with joe it was such a unexpected direction for the series to take and i think it really uh did it super well it just made it really engaging um for me, the video game character that I think would be the best to live their life would be the champion of Cyrodiil from The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. And I say that mainly only because by the end of the game, your character, if you play the DLC, becomes a god within the pantheon of all the gods within the lore of the Elder Scrolls universe. And it's even referenced in Skyrim specifically, you encounter this god again and it is the same player character from The Elder Scrolls IV. So I can't think of another video game that has such a intense level of almost like wish fulfillment where you your character is from humble beginnings to truly the highest aspirations anyone within the fantasy realm could achieve. My pick is Steve in Minecraft. <laughs> oh my gosh. Jeez. Steve gets to go on adventures 
build whatever he wants. Um, he gets to fight creatures, but they're not too scary. It's not like he's in Resident Evil or anything. Like he, They're manageable. So you're living in the wild. You have awesome landscapes to explore. If you're feeling lazy, you can just go into creative mode, fly around, and build whatever you want. You can even build computers in Minecraft so you can have a sophisticated society for yourself. I think this life, the life of Steve, sounds incredible. Okay, so real quick, after everyone's opening statements, only one of you chose the character from a game that I've played. Which one? Jacob. But I think you all have relatively good picks, and I look forward to hearing what else you have to say. Joe, would you really want to be a pirate? Like, living in that era, the hygiene situation is terrible. Sharp point. Just living in the era, there's disease and rape. You're a very wanted man. People, like, people want you dead. The, the best part about Edward Kenway, aside from being a boss pirate, which is something that I think everyone at some point has thought would have been pretty cool when they watch Pirates of the Caribbean movies, is that at the end of the game, spoiler alert here, so don't pay attention if you want to play the game, but he essentially finds out he has a daughter and he takes the daughter and he goes back to England. He's filthy rich and he gets to do whatever the heck he wants for the rest of his life. But to so, get to that position of power, you have to murder so many people and do you, terrible you murder, things. Which you is an interesting point people. that applies to both Joe's answer and Tim's. Yeah. Tim's hmm. Tim's character can definitely go to some pretty dark places if if you want well, to. I, I Ethical wanna... dilemma, for sure. For sure, yeah. But when you're a god, you kind of create your own morals, so it doesn't really yeah, matter. Fair point, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but going back to Edward Kenway, I actually am really glad Joe brought up the mention of a daughter because in the epilogue sequence for that game, we see just how fractured, even decades later, because his daughter was like, what, six? When they reunite, how yeah. fractured their relationship is because she basically sees... Edward as having walked out on her mom and her when she was basically about to be born. And so I just think it's a really difficult character to want to be because even though Edward has this amazing arc through the game from basically Han Solo-esque scruffy nerf herder who doesn't really give a, a hoot about anyone else. And then he slowly comes to have more responsibility, more responsibility, rising up to the ranks of the assassins. And then even becoming the leader of the English based clan at the end of the game um, and beyond. I just think it's such a challenging life that I personally wouldn't want to le- live as having basically really wronged a child of mine. Wow. Tim makes a very good argument against you, Joe. Look, Edward Kenway came a long way in his life. He started from the bottom and now he's at the top. And but I, with what I, cost? I, I, I guess mm, you're referring to like cost? the epilogue sequence where they're in the, the theater at the end. Um, I don't. I don't think that's an indication of of his daughter still hating him. I, I think that there was plenty of time there to fix that. And I, you can assume what you want about his relationship with her, but I think the final scene when they're like finally getting to know each other as they sail off into the sunset um, is kind of a testament to his redeeming qualities. And if I were him, I think I could make it up to the daughter who's six years old and hopefully <laughs> uh, break through that <laughs> little so, hatred she has okay, for Joe, him. I have to give it to you. That was actually one of the most touching moments I've ever played in a game, sailing the boat yeah, with your daughter. Yeah, it's great. When they're just like kind of awkwardly like getting to know each other and it's it's really cute. She keeps calling it a boat and he's like, it's a ship. And yeah, it, it made exactly. me laugh. <laughs> Jacob, would you feel bad using your cute little pets as fighting tools no. for your own gain? I feel like in real life, using these cute little creatures to fight for you to earn money would just make you feel terrible. Hmm, sounds uh, a little bit um, like cockfighting, which got Michael Vick suspended from the NFL. Yeah, Ooh. I don't know if you can really apply those same rules, though. Real quick, David said in the real world, but we're in the world of the Pokemon. Exactly, yeah. I mean, if you want to go by the rules of the game, Pokemon that you train actually become stronger and healthier than the ones you'd find in the wild. Plus... Healthcare is free. Extremely easy to heal your Pokemon completely. I love that point. That is so funny to uh, me. Specifically, Generation 2, they introduced the friendship mechanic. <laughs> so, you can actually make your Pokemon like you more. And treat them well. And if your Pokemon loves you the most, then it could evolve from an Eevee into an Umbreon if it's at night. I know. It's... Ugh, what an amazing world that would be. <laughs> That's like... I just imagine, like, 
because I think we're all pretty big dog fans here, just loving your dog enough that it evolves into an even better dog. That's so cool. I like my dog yeah. just how he is. <laughs> I'll, I'll give a quick argument against uh, both Steve and um, the Pokemon trainer. For Steve, I, I think I would go literally insane if I had to be in the Minecraft world listening to that piano music my uh, entire yes. life. That <laughs> piano music with... is incredible. It's okay. it's great. It's great for multiple hours on end, but you're talking your entire life living in complete solitude, building things, and I, I would go crazy. It's not complete solitude. There are other people in the Minecraft world. Are we allowed to play with other people? Are we saying the, the online component is the world we're existing in? I don't know. That's semantics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just picturing like Minecraft where it's just you in a world with all these monsters and maybe some of those little weird people in villages... I don't know. I, th- I think that would get lonely and sad, <laughs> but that's just me. <laughs> I guess maybe if it's multiplayer, it'd be different. But you're still living in a pixelated world with very little definition, which I think would be tough on yeah, the eyes. Yeah, that would really suck. The food looks <laughs> pretty good, though. And then, to Jacob's well, point, hey, if it's after you finish sore. all your training and stuff, and you're the best Pokemon trainer in the world, it. I mean, I, I haven't played that game. I've only played the, the originals, um, like Red, Blue, and stuff. But all the adults in Pokemon seem like super sad and they never leave their house. And I just picture that's what's going to happen to you. And that sounds depressing also. That's what Jacob does already, though. Yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> brutal. If you're if you're the uh, the champion of the Pokemon League, it's implied that you will just face strong trainers in battle for the rest of your life. So it's the equivalent of being, say, a professional athlete. Yeah. Hey, yeah. I actually think the Pokemon trainer thing has a really cool kind of retirement scenario to like becoming a gym leader somewhere yeah that sounds like a fun retirement to me tim you're supposed to be arguing against jake yeah i would say uh tim has done a very good job of making my decision for me (laughs) (laughs) what is that decision noah uh i would pick being a pokemon trainer i knew it oh the solitude doesn't exactly appeal to me although i would probably like the piano music i don't like the idea of being a pirate that's fair. And also, you know, leaving your wife and kid that just, no thank yeah, you. Yeah, but you're rich. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, I don't know how I feel about becoming a god. So, I'm going to go with the Pokemon trainer. Especially a crazy god like Shiogorath. Uh, that's who you become, right? bring that up. <laughs> but he seems to have so much fun with it. Yeah, he's, he's literally the god of madness. That, that'd be too much. <laughs> One point for Jacob. Question number two. What is the best video game console of all time? I'll start again since it seemed to work out for me so far. I'm going to say the Nintendo DS. This was kind of a... I had to think about this one for a while. I knew it had to be a Nintendo console. I think Nintendo really shines with their handhelds. To me, the defining Nintendo handheld is actually the DS because the introduction of both two screens and a touchscreen, it's so crazy that it just might work, and we know that it did. It um, From the get-go had uh, the amazing Super Mario 64 DS port that boosted the graphics, the, the whole experience with four different characters. Um, from a home console game that kind of blew my mind just from first getting my hands on it. And then game after game after game on that system used the touchscreen in new and exciting ways, as well as the, uh, the two screen hardware. So, um, I think it is the best console because it offers the most from a gameplay experience to such a wide variety of games. I prefer my gaming to be done on the big screen. That is why I chose the Xbox 360. There, I would say there's a place for portable consoles, handheld gaming, but um, the 360 blows these out of the water. First, the controller is my favorite video game controller of all time. Perfectly ergonomic, the triggers are amazing, and probably much better than the Joy-Cons. And then the whole game lineup for the 360 is just incredible, especially the exclusives on the 360, which included Halo 3, ODST, Reach, Halo 4, Crackdown, Classic, Xbox Exclusive, Gears of War 1, um, Fable 2, 
And these are just the exclusive. Obviously, there are a lot more that were also on PS3, but I think the 360 is a better console overall. And in particular, the Halo series is my favorite FPS series or maybe favorite video game series of all time. And the Halo series just set a precedent for first-person shooters that really has totally been copied by other series out there. I also think Xbox Live in general, which the 360 kind of brought to a whole new level after the original Xbox, is a huge feature of the 360 that beats out the PS3 and other consoles with online services now. Um, They started the Games with Gold program, which allowed me to get free games from a few years back that I wouldn't have bought, but I've played them, and there have been some great games on the Games with Gold um, lineup, which are now also on Xbox One, so that's been a really cool program on the Xbox. Also, the graphics capabilities of the 360 were pretty revolutionary at the time, and what really impressed me was eight years later after the release of the 360, um, I was playing the Destiny beta on the 360, which was also on the newer gen consoles, the Xbox One, but the graphics had changed so much on the same console it was really incredible just to see that that hardware could push the graphics from Halo 3, which are good but not like incredible, all the way to the level of graphics like Destiny and the later games we're at eight years later down the road. So those are just a few of my reasons. Joe, do you want to go next? Uh, yeah, sure. My answer is definitely the oldest out of all those that everybody's picked. Uh, I'm going to go with the NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System. Um mainly because uh, it was the first and best of its kind, and it kind of paved the way for home game consoles, and I think things like the Xbox and uh, um, GameCubes and even portable stuff like the 3DS wouldn't be there without um, an advent like that. And it it's quoted, uh, my research I, <laughs> that I did um, often quoted it as being basically the reason that um, – the video game home console market in America was resuscitated after it crashed and people kind of lost interest in video games at home. Um, and it's just, it's a great console and it, it pushed forth a lot of games that were revolutionary for its time. And, um, even today, you know, the nostalgia factor is huge, uh, which kind of adds to its greatness. Joe, what NES games have you played? (laughs) Uh, Super Mario World, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Super Super Mario. Oh my gosh. Are you thinking of the Super Nintendo? No, Super Mario World was for NES. No. That's or, sorry, sorry not, not World, Bros. Super Mario Bros. Just making sure. Okay, well, bad. I, Super Mario World is an excellent game. But um, I would say, just for the sake of the discussion, I'm going to say a different one, even though probably I'd argue the 360. I'm going to say the PlayStation 2. This was my first home game console, but I would argue, I believe it's still the console to have sold the most copies ever. Um, it... So, like, first of all, that's just an extremely wide amount of people that found an appeal to the console. And I think mainly because the sheer breadth of all the different types of games they released, like, truly a staggering amount of different software titles were released on that console. Like, the last official PS2 release game was, I believe, an MLB game for either 2014 or 2016. And that's crazy that they were releasing games up until just two years ago or so. And, um... It did have online capabilities, but I think it really prided itself on having a really wide assortment of different great games. Like Gran Turismo 4 was regarded as a really great racer at the time. Um, you have the SOCOM games for tactical shooters, um, Ratchet and Clank for platforming and shooting, um, Jack and Daxter for more platforming, just like a really great different types of games to appeal to a wide amount of people. My family had a Super Nintendo not an NES, and I have a 2DS, not a DS. But that's all pretty close. I'm anxious to hear what you guys say about each other's picks. Yeah, I I know for a fact it can't be the Xbox 360. Oh. Two factors. I'll start with a I'll start with the smaller factor. Um the first is that in my research for the Nintendo Switch announcement, I found this really interesting um spreadsheet uh someone at IGN made that adjusts every launch price for every home console since 1982, excuse me, since 1972, um, takes their launch price and adjusts it for inflation. The first most expensive is the PlayStation 3, 
at 596 or 715 depending on which version you got yeah that was a debacle oh that was yeah. so sad then the next most expensive was the xbox 360 that huge price point went on to have a 54.2 percent failure rate in 2009 one which microsoft did not dispute xbox 360s are notorious for failing uh it's a long and drawn out process to get a new one and i personally have dealt with that problem before it's enough to turn you off uh from a company like microsoft as far as gaming so i think that uh those factors have no place in the best gaming console of all time for sure i have to agree with jacob i completely forgot about the red ring it happened to me twice even after i paid for i believe it was called the xbox 360 elite which was supposed to be a version that was immune to it, and then it still happened. And I was There's like, no way it happened on yes, that it one. it did, David. I swear, it did. As much as that sucked, I think that's a bad reason to not pick it as the best. I think Microsoft handled the Red Ring of Death pretty well. I mean, yeah, it was a pain for the first year, but they had a free replacement program. And overall, the console was one of the main home consoles for over eight years. So, I mean, one out of eight years is really not too bad. And David, you could just make the argument with the Xbox 360S or whatever that version was. Tim, what did you argue for? PlayStation or PlayStation 2? PlayStation 2, not play, PlayStation 1 now. Okay. What, one, did you guys one know that PlayStation on the 360, 1 came out? Well, I, my thing was just a fun tidbit, but I was going to say that, did you know that the PlayStation came out before Nintendo 64? That that I just saw that and it kind of blew my well, mind. The, it's actually really funny because there's some severe animosity in the past between Nintendo and Sony. The whole reason Sony even entered the home console market was because um, Nintendo truly went behind the backs of Sony, who they had contract contracted to make a CD based, a CD ROM based game, home game console, which is originally going to be the Nintendo 64. Nintendo went behind Sony's back because they didn't like Sony's practices. I don't know why. Went to Philips. Sony heard about this. Was like, okay, screw you, Nintendo. We're gonna go. Basically, the ultimate Bender the Robot quote from Futurama. We're gonna go. Um, have our own club with blackjack and hookers and <laughs> instead of blackjack and hookers it was with really cool sony exclusives and a dual shot controller with two analog sticks <laughs> well no that that was oh, after, after the playstation one yeah well, eventually the playstation one had two sticks yeah, but it was after you're right okay my bad i know nobody picked the ps3 but i think i kind of had to compare it to the 360 since it was its equivalent or its adversary but just xbox live i think just blew the PlayStation Network out of the water during his time. And that's just something I wanted to point out. It was just a better online community. I think most people would agree with that. Because the PS3 sucked. Yeah, I even as a Sony fanboy, I will say the PS3 had an extremely turbulent cycle, even though I loved some of the games on there. Do you have any questions you want to ask? Before? I don't have any questions, but I do have some thoughts. Uh, I do think that the the best attribute that the Xbox 360 has and what would be its best selling point to be the best console of all time is that it was the first console that got online right. It ran its eight-year cycle very well. I mean, you think about the very first Xbox 360 interface with like the weird cards and stuff. The blades. The blades. Classic. And then taking that to like the new Xbox experience. I thought it, it did a good job of evolving over its eight year period. For the NES, I think that it's one of those situations where the Super Nintendo was like the next better evolution of it. I think you would have had a much better argument if you used the Super Nintendo, especially given Super Mario World. I think was the Ninja Turtles game you were thinking of, Turtles in Time? No, it was just Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Okay. Well, Turtles in Time was really good, and that was on the Super Nintendo. So I'm not going to pick the NES. What? Try to base it off of our arguments, not your preference. Okay. Who made the better overall points? So you are going to pick the NES. Oh. Uh, well, even then, I, I do think that David selling the online component of the 360 and how it was the first console to really kind of make it worth, worth kind of delving into, even kind of a, comparing it to the PS3, Sony had to really work out the kinks uh, much, over a much longer period than Microsoft did with the Xbox. I think even though the DS kind of did introduce this dual screen uh, way of playing games, I think 360 wins. Hey, yo. 
I would have picked 360 if you hadn't picked it. Over 50% fail rate. Most Xboxes broke. But when they got Later, I have, even then, I have to admit, when they got it right, which is I feel like they had a turbulent start ish and then just hit it so strong. Like seven out of the like eight Halo years. 3, oh my. And Reach, like ODST, just man, really great series and creative minds. Plus, every other non exclusive Xbox game yeah. that was also on the PS3, like Red Dead. Oh, yeah. Red Dead was excellent on the 360. Yeah. I mean, the only game that I have to defend the playstation 3 against at that time would be the uncharted series and yeah it's just the the 360 man is is really excellent i get the point okay last debate question what is the best nintendo game ever timothy so i'm gonna be bringing everything together and synthesizing what we were talking about with the switch to me what is nintendo as an outsider to nintendo it is fun and experience based with friends unique control styles and ultimately just really wacky characters and colorful graphical displays and the only game i can think of that combines all of that is the best is warrior way twisted for the game boy advance did you ever play that any of y'all yeah yeah i did i did too seriously this is nintendo at its absolute best firing on all cylinders it took what was already a monster system, the Game Boy Advanced and the uh, Advanced SP, great, great, great library of games, and then and then made what had already been a really fun mini game series, and completely kind of turned it on its head, and twisted it. And twisted it. You know, it kind of switched things up a little. But um, <laughs> what was so fun about it is I have this distinct memory. <laughs> <laughs> I have this distinct memory where I was playing it in my car, and my dad like looked back at me like furiously turning my uh, Game Boy to, like, win the mini games, And he's like, stop shaking your Game Boy like that. And I was like, but I need you to play. And he just kind of had this, like, oh. Like, <laughs> he was very surprised and caught off guard by how, I guess, ingenious and different the control style was. And just, Wario is such a funny character. The humor was great. And um, I would just say it combined everything that made Nintendo games so much fun. That's why it is the best Nintendo game. I'm going to go with my favorite game of all time. Which to our longtime listeners will know to be Paper Mario: The Thousand Year Door for the GameCube, which was at its time the most portable home console. <laughs> as we all know from the from the Switch announcement. But really, if there's one thing you need to know about Paper Mario: The Thousand Year Door, is that everything about it is designed to give you a well-rounded and fulfilling gaming experience. It's an RPG with turn-based battles that have action command elements that allow for skill to be um, a great factor in your play other than just strategy. It has amazing uh, organization of the story and of the world. Um, You progress through it so gracefully. And um, the art design and music are so ageless. Um, more so than any game I've ever seen. This game is never going to grow old, and um, it's got me coming back year after year to play through it again. Joseph? All right, I was going to uh, pick Super Mario Bros. for similar reasons why I picked the NES, but since I didn't win with the NES, I'm going to change my strategy, despite the fact that Super Mario Bros. has many things going for it, including the most iconic soundtrack in all video game history. But uh, I'm going to go with... uh, a game that, what, like Tim said, kind of is the epitome of the Nintendo experience, which is groups of people and motion control and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm going to go with Mario Kart, but specifically Mario Kart 8, which I think was the best. Obviously, racing game, amazing. Uh, tons of fun. You can play it over and over. That and Super Smash, I think, or just Smash Bros. in general, are probably some of the most played Nintendo games time-wise. Um, you can pick them up and play them for as long or as short as you want. They make a great drinking game if you're into that. And uh, <laughs> also, it's just the the motion control thing, being able to adapt that to a video game. I think that was most evident in kind of the steering controls for Mario Kart, which were very frustrating, but also challenging and very cool. Big D? I chose our favorite game in the hostel, Super Smash Bros. for the Nintendo 64. Aww. And I know nobody would argue with me there because we've definitely played it the most together over the past five years the replayability and the intricacies of it are just incredible it was 
different than the other fighter games that came out at the time, which are not like platform based, like smashes, but health bar based. And they completely changed that with smash. I don't, I was trying to look up other like platform fighters like that. And I'm not sure if there are others besides smash that came before that at least. So it was pretty revolutionary that way. Personally, it's my favorite because it's the most simple. Some would complain that it's like slower than Melee or Brawl or the other games, but um, I like the simplicity, but it can still be mastered at like an in-depth level. Those are all my basic reasons why I think it's the best Nintendo game. I just love all those games. Yeah. I love Nintendo so much. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll start with, I think I'm going to have to knock Smash down a few pegs here. And I think because How could you it, not to it's no fault of its own, but I don't think Nintendo had really perfected the telltale Nintendo polish yet. We've played Smash for as much Smash as we played. It happened very often, but the game does crash sometimes and there's weird sound issues and it's um, it's a lot of really rough textures on not great polygons, even by the N64 standard. And I think Paper Mario what it does is it willingly restricts itself to kind of a simpler design with the paper thing. Everything looks like these cutouts, but that allows for it to be absolutely perfected in from a graphical standpoint. So um, it really helps build the immersion and you really sometimes forget you're playing a game because of how seamless the whole thing is. Smash 64 how many times has it crashed over the past five years we've been playing it? I really cannot remember. Yeah, there's been some sound issues and there are glitches in the game, but the glitches actually make it more fun. Smash physics. Pretty much all of them. So I don't think it doesn't crash. I mean, just as much as a Xbox One game crashes today, I don't think that's a knock on it at all. In defense of Smash 64, it is the only game that we mentioned that can be fixed by simply blowing on a cartridge. <laughs> so, uh, WarioWare Twisted was still cartridge based. It had a yeah, gyroscope but, in the cartridge. That's that, yeah. pretty cool. <laughs> I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, that was like the gimmick. Yeah, it the yeah, yeah the, they twist it to win the mini games. So it was arguably the first instance of Nintendo based motion controls. Which is, wow, that's literally everything for the past near decade. That's not true, actually. There was a game called Kirby Tilt and Tumble for the Game Boy Color uh, that had a, a gyroscope Wow! inside. It was sick. It was great. You, yeah, you held it. You had to hold it flat um, and then tilt Kirby to the end of oh, the stage. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, man. That was like I, one of my I first think games. you would argue that the motion sensing capabilities of Nintendo weren't perfected until the Wii and Mario Kart 8. Dude, Joe, I'm Joe, sorry. Joe, I'm man. sorry. You're confused, man. Yeah, WarioWare Twisted is a heck of a game. Also, Mario I've, Kart 8 I've was on the Wii U. It. Joe, did you hear me? What, you said it was for Wii U? Yeah, Mario Kart Wii was on the Wii. Mario Kart 8 was for Wii U? That's that's true, yeah. Mario Kart uh, Wii introduced the motion controls, and that okay. game sucked. I guess I guess it wasn't the first of its kind, but that's true. Mario Kart 8 was a great but game. I, it is an amazing game. All right, no, based well, on the arguments... It honestly pains me to say it just because I had some really good tie-breaking trivia questions up my sleeve. Oh, it's either me or Jacob? But I'm going to give it to Jacob. No! Yes! Oh my gosh! I think his argument about Thousand Year Door being an RPG and the game design and the way that it incorporates skill as well as just strategy, it really sets it apart as the the best argument Though I don't necessarily agree with that choice, I think he had the best argument. Mm. Nobody really took a shot at it, unfortunately. Yeah. Dude. It is a really good game, and I played I've the whole played thing, it. and it's really Jacob, good. Jacob, is, is Paper Mario a turn-based game? Yeah. I hate that. Automatic <laughs> loss. You should play it. I think I, you might like it. I personally I have tried it. I don't like it that much either. Well, you are the champion. Congratulations. Uh, once more. Returning. I, I hope I get invited back. And defending. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us, Noah, being our judge. Yeah, no problem. I know you let some bias slip in that first decision. I know. I'm sorry. Well, I, yeah, it's difficult to to force myself to become a oh I unbiased thought, third party. I thought that was the most one sided argument. Pokemon Trainer is at, never at any risk of dying. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good one. All right, thanks guys so much for being here, Tim, Joe, Jacob, and of course our judge Noah. 
If you've now seen Rogue One and you hadn't when we released the spoiler episode back in December, go back and check that out. I think it's pretty fun. Um, and if not, we will see you every other week, our regular schedule here on Hostile Discourse for Season 2. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Later. Bye. Thanks for listening to Hostile Discourse. Subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. And check out our other social media accounts linked in the show notes. Join us next time for more inexhaustible debate over the most questionable of topics. 